What does it take to become a master? And what does it mean? Take someone like Vincent van Gogh, who created over 900 paintings throughout his lifetime. Van Gogh mastered the art of light and expression, devoted his entire life to it, in fact, and ultimately was barely even recognized for it during his lifetime. So, why did he do it? Why did he pursue mastery? Robert Greene spent years studying the subject, interviewing contemporary masters, reading biographies of classical masters, and studying the academic research on the subject. Green broke down what a master is and what it takes to become one. Well, masters are people who, because of their intense connection to what they're studying, because of their love for it, they actually learn faster. They learn more intensely than other people. And they generate this kind of momentum where they push past all of those obstacles and they reach the top of this mountain. It could take 10, it could take 20 years. But at the top of that mountain, they have perfect perspective. They can see in all directions. They have a, a real solid grasp on their field. They can <clears throat> They can make connections between an idea over here and an idea over there that you can't see when you're part way down the mountain because you don't have that kind of perspective. <clears throat> this command of their field is immensely satisfying and is even godlike. And I am saying that this is the highest form of intelligence we humans can achieve. In this video, I'll attempt to break down some of Green's central points about how to develop mastery in a way that you can apply to your life and career. The first point that Green makes about developing mastery is the importance of finding and following your calling. Green explains that we all have something that lights us up, something that we're naturally gifted at or have a strong proclivity for. Most likely, this is something that we loved to do when we were young. Green suggests reconnecting with this passion and following it. Whatever it is, it's a sign that you are drawn to this thing in a way that's pre-verbal. You can't even explain. And that is the manifestation of your uniqueness. And I compare this uniqueness that each one of you has to a voice that's inside of your head. It's telling you, you should be doing this. You should be doing this. It's what fits you. It's what you're good at. But what happens with all of us as you get older is that voice gets weaker and weaker. You listen to your parents who say you need to be a doctor or a lawyer, you need to worry about making money, ah, da, 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 da. You listen to f peers who are saying, this is a cool job, this is the kind of profession you should be going into. You start thinking in terms of what really matters is I have to be comfortable, I have to look for a position that's comfortable. To the point where you could graduate from college, you could be in your early 20s, and you have no idea who you are, that voice is totally drowned out. Green explains that if you don't want to become obsolete in your later working years, then you have to become incredibly skilled at something. Often when people don't have a particularly strong interest in their work, it's because they didn't follow their true calling. This is why it's important to recognize what you're truly interested in, so that you will have the drive and willpower to consistently improve further down the road. So the game of life, if it is a game, the end game is to be irreplaceable. You're one of a kind, you're original. There's nobody who can replace you, just as there's nobody who can replace Leonardo da Vinci. There's no one else like Napoleon Bonaparte. There's no one else like Steve Jobs. I know these are huge figures that are, that are larger than life, but even in, on, low, on smaller levels and people I deal with in the business world, I can generally say that if they're masters, there's nobody else that can take their place. And that is the ultimate position of power in this world. And that's what everybody in here should eventually aim at. Similarly, it's easy for many people to get sidetracked and end up following the wrong path. This can mean chasing money, fame, prestige, or respect rather than following something for the intrinsic joy that it brings you. That's not to say that any of these are evil as a byproduct, but singularly chasing them is not a recipe for satisfaction in life. Because things like wealth and fame should be viewed as merely tools, not domains. Chasing only money is similar to a carpenter pursuing carpentry in order to have the best tools. But once he's achieved this, what will have been the point if he's not creating anything? We have three educations in our life. The first is from our parents, the second is from our schoolmasters, and the third is from the world. And the third education contradicts all that we learn from the first two. And basically, what it means is you go and you learn all of these skills and all these very important things in university, 
but essentially the years that follow, what I'm going to call your apprenticeship, requires a different way of thinking. The, the rules are completely different. It's not the same. In fact, many of the things that you learn and many of the habits that you learn early in your life are actually the wrong kinds of things that, you, that are going to help you, that you need in this path towards mastery that I'm drawing. Green suggests that this third education, the one we receive from the world, is the most important. This is what he calls the apprenticeship stage, in which you learn from someone who has developed the skills that you one day hope to develop. Green says this is important because it teaches many lessons that weren't taught in formal schooling and gives an opportunity to learn and progress through actual work. However, this apprenticeship stage doesn't have to be a job. It could also be a self-taught apprenticeship in which you focus on building and expanding your skills by following in the footsteps of a master, whether through reading or other means. The important aspect of this is the continued dedication and progression over an extended period of time. Sometimes what happens to people, they leave the apprenticeship phase and they feel like they've learned it all. And they stop this process of feeding the brain experiences and it all kind of dies and they become what I call conventional. I say that children are born with what we call an original mind, which is a creative in a childlike way. And that what happens to people is they get conventional, a conventional mind that goes around in the same grooves. That's what Steve Jobs called it. It's like gro the grooves of a record. And you just go around and around and around. This mind that I'm talking about is the dimensional mind. It has vast dimensions that it can explore because you fed it. And when you enter this phase, you want to keep that momentum, learning more, practicing more, experimenting, failing if you want, constantly feeding it with new experiences. And that creativity comes of its own because that's how the brain operates. Green points out that becoming a master is a continual process. If you want to develop high-level skills in a particular field, you must continue to learn even after you've become an expert. To avoid developing the conventional mind, you have to keep developing so that your skills afford you the ability to innovate. If you want long-term success, it's important to maintain this attitude throughout your career. Sometimes the notion of power and mastery is seen as, as something a little bit ugly or selfish. It's as if being ambitious and taking this path, you're only thinking about yourself. It's like it's egocentric. And in fact, I think it's the opposite. Green compares the idea of mastery in society to the concept of biodiversity in nature. He explains that the discovery of biodiversity shows us that ecosystems which are diverse are much more resilient. Mutations that develop through natural selection are what create this diversity. Humans, while we are biological, are also cultural. Green explains that culture developed as a way to pass down traditions and ideas to future generations. Green goes on to say that in culture, the equivalent of a beneficial biodiverse mutation is our uniqueness. That's what makes culture diverse and resilient. That is why we celebrate a period like the Renaissance, because it was so diverse, because there were so many different kinds of Leonardo da Vinci's. And you have the, the good fortune of finally living in a world where there are no more barriers, where power and mastery is no longer the domain of just white men, where you have access to the kind of information that a da Vinci could, could dream of. And you live in a world with incredible problems that we are facing. And so it's almost your responsibility to become a master and to bring out that uniqueness and contribute. The most selfish people in the world are those who merely consume what other people have created in the past and don't contribute anything. So that's sort of my ultimate message to you all. And that's the end of my talk. Considering the many paths to take, I think the pursuit of mastery is a worthwhile one. Mastery is a noble goal because it takes an immense amount of dedication and passion and can bring about an incredibly rewarding life. However, that doesn't mean it's the only path, just one of many ways of living. If you're interested in learning more about the topic, you can check out Robert Greene's full interview on YouTube, which is where the quotes in this video are from, or his book, Mastery.